Hello, everyone, again, <coughs> in class and in cyberspace. We're going to talk about co-graphs today and read once Boolean functions. <coughs> the title is Read Once Functions Revisited, meaning that you'll be some newer things than uh, appeared in the old-fashioned literature. And here we have a picture again of uh, the view from Professor Rogers Matthews' uh, office uh, when he was in Haifa. So I'll talk about what read ones functions are, some motivation. We will discuss co graphs and co trees, the graph of a Boolean formula, the property of normality and some previous work on read once functions, and our method for recognizing read once functions and uh, using the class of graphs called co-graphs. Especially uh, the notion of how to implement checking normality will be important, and some uh, other results. So. Although you're used to talking graphs, I will start by first talking about an application called read once functions. <coughs> a Boolean function that has a factored form in which each variable appears only once will be called a read once function. And as you can see in this uh, example, we have here a formula, as you might have in logic or uh, some satisfiability problem, AQ or ABP or ABD. Now this formula has A appearing three times, has B appearing twice, but we can pull out the A, pull out the B, and the, we have this equivalent logic form where every variable appears exactly once. That's the idea of a read once function, that you can factor it into a form where every variable appears exactly once. Why might you be interested in that? Well, imagine if you have a and or circuit that implements this function. You only have one input for A, one put input for B, etc. It goes into gates. You have no, no place where A has to be split into two different gates. Everything is unique. Here are some examples of some non-read ones functions. If I had the formula AB or BC or CD, you can try using pencil and paper to factor that. You will not succeed in factoring it so that each one of those four letters appears only once. Similarly, AB, BC, AC, you will not succeed. If you try to pull out the A, you'll be stuck. You won't be able to get rid of the uh, uh, two Cs, etc. Lastly, I'm assuming that these re read ones functions are assumed to be positive. That is, if I allow a variable to appear only once, well, if it appears in its negative form, I'll just rename it into its positive form. So if I have a not A, I'll just rename it to be A prime. And since it can only appear once, either as A or not A, I may assume without loss of generality that everything is positive. These are sometimes called uh, monotonic functions. So our motivation for looking at this problem actually started by looking at a problem of how to factor general Boolean functions into a short form, a problem which is very important in circuit design, very well studied for 50 years, and is very, very difficult. How to create a formula that is as short as possible for an arbitrary Boolean function. For read ones functions, as a very special case, it's the case where, in fact, you can and you are able to, in very good order complexity, 
to squeeze that factor into the optimal form. The optimal form would be where everything appears once. So I'm looking at this read once function ball motivated by a larger problem to factor general fun functions. That general subject I'll talk about tomorrow. Today we'll formulate things about read once functions. Now to do this, I'm going to define the graph of a Boolean function. So each literal or variable of the function is assigned a vertex in a graph that is called the co-occurrence graph. So we have the vertices being a1 through an. These are the variables. And each prime implicant, sometimes called a min term, sometimes called a cube, forms a clique in this graph, gamma, not necessarily ma maximal. Formally, I have an edge between ai and aj if ai and aj appear somewhere together in the prime implicate. They co-occur. Remember, we saw co-occurrence graphs a few uh, lectures ago in a different context. So here's an example. If this was my formula, this is a sum of products form. You see in the first term, A, C, E, sorry, A, C, D occur together. So in my graph, A, C, D ought to be a triangle. A, C, D. They are a triangle. Similarly, AEF is a triangle, AEF. So each one of these terms is giving me some edges in this graph. This is the co-occurrence graph. Every prime implicant gave me a clique, not necessarily a maximal. Notice, for example, here, uh, no, don't notice for now. Now we'll put that to the side. And I want to introduce the family of co-graphs. And then we will merge the two ideas together. A co-graph is defined in this recursive manner. A single vertex is a co-graph. The disjoint union of co-graphs is a co-graph. And the join of co-graphs is a co-graph. Join means that I take a bunch of co-graphs and I add all of the edges between them. It's and I can record how I build this in a data structure called the co-tree. In this data structure, as we'll see in an example in a minute, the leaves of this co-tree will be labeled by the vertices themselves. The union operation, the disjoint union, will be apparent labeled 0. And the join operation will be apparent labeled 1. Here on the right is my co-graph. Here is the co-tree. Let's look at the co-tree and see how we built this co-graph. Well, here I have three independent vertices with a zero node. That means I take the disjoint union of these three greens. Here are the three greens, and I take their disjoint union. That is the left side. I have two pink ones. I have a zero above it. So that's also the disjoint union. And now, above that, I have a one, meaning I take this subgraph and the other subgraph, and I join them with all possible edges between the two sides. Just this very shallow coterie already gives you complete bipartite graphs. Uh, these are examples of co-trees, but here are some others. Clearly, the complement of a co-graph is also a co-graph. Why? Because the complement can be obtained simply by taking the same co-tree, changing the labels, ones to zero, zeros to one. And I will get the coterie for the complement. The complement of a connected co-graph is disconnected. That's a property. And two vertices of a co-graph 
are adjacent if and only if their lowest common ancestor in the coterie is labeled 1. This is a very easy way to take the coterie and decide connectivity between a pair of edges or not. You just take them, go up your tree until you find the common parent, and at that common parent, uh, you know whether they're connected or disconnected, depending on its label. Zero, not connected. One, connected. And I would say that the coterie is a unique representation of the co-graph up to isomorphism. I can certainly take a tree and move the branches around and around. It's the hierarchy that's important. And then there are two views of how to view this. One is this con recursive construction bottom up. I take, I take uh, vertices, I join them, I take disjoint unions, I join those, and I build it up, up, up till I get the final co-graph. That is this recursive construction. Okay. Alternatively, I could, call, I could view it as a recursive decomposition. If I had a co-tree, or if I had the graph, I would be taking the whole graph, I would look, how can I break it? If it's disconnected already, then each piece become uh, a subgraph underneath a zero node. And then I re continue recursively. If it's connected, then I can look at the complement. It will be disjoint. It will have disjoint uh, components. Each of those, again, I can look at as separate graphs, which I will have joined all together and continue building the coterie by recursion. Now, <clears throat> we all know the term about uh, looking for graphs that have forbidden uh, subgraphs. A P4 free graph is a graph that has no induced P4. Here's a picture of P4. It's the path with three edges and four vertices. A graph that has no induced subgraph, P4, is called P4. And there we have the definition. And lo and behold, P4 free graphs are equivalent to co-graphs. Co-graphs defined through this decomposition. The P4 graphs defined by some local forbidden configuration. On the left, I have a co-graph. Notice it has no P4. It ha its path of P4 ha is closed into a cycle. It has no induced P4. On the other hand, on the right, my 5 cycle has 5 different P4s. So it is not P4 free, and so it is not a co-graph. And here is the very nice characterization theorem. A graph is a co-graph if and only if it has a co-tree representation. That almost goes if and only if because that's the way we build it and record the, how it's constructed. The equivalent condition P4 free is what I've just stated, but we haven't proven. And the last condition, every subset of vertices of size 1 or larger larger than one, either the induced subgraph on that subset is disconnected or its complement is disconnected. That's not at all clear why that should be an equivalent condition, but I think I would like to prove that. Mm, yeah. So let's go to the pen and, pen and paper to prove this theorem. <coughs> OK. So the cameraman would look at my page. We'll see that uh, the first condition was with that G is a co-graph. And I want to show that uh, that implies that it's P4 free. Well, suppose it's a co-graph. I have a co-tree representation for it. 
and suppose to the contrary there exists a P4 somewhere in the graph. Here's my graph on the right. Well, what is the node at the top of the co-tree? Well, what's its label? Either my graph G is disconnected. If it's disconnected, so it has a bunch of different connected components, the label is zero. And where would a P4, where would this P4 exist? Well, if these are connected components, it would have to exist inside one of those components. By, if I assume that uh, by induction, smaller graphs satisfy the theorem, then it cannot, these are co-graphs, it cannot li live in a smaller by, in by uh, induction. That handles the dis disconnected case. For G, the case for G connected, it's a co-graph. The label here would be 1. That means that I have co-graphs that are completely joined to each other. Well, again, where is my P4? P4 looks something like this. On the A, B, C, D. A and C are not connected. So that means that A and C cannot be in different components, right? A and C would have to live in the same component because they're a non-edge. Similarly, A and D is a non-edge. So A and D, D, D cannot be uh, over here in one of these other components since it's a non-edge. So D is also not here. Is, it must be together with A and C. Where is B? Where is B? Well, on the one hand, it's disjoint from D. So it cannot be in one of these outer suburbs. So it must be here inside the same component. Now, A, B, and C, D are all in the same component. That would give me a P4 inside one of the components. This is a smaller co-graph. That's a contradiction to the uh, induction hypothesis. So we've proved that the implication co-graph implies P4 free is true. Now let's go on to the next implication. Suppose the graph is P4 free. I want to prove that this uh, last condition holds. That is, that for every x that is size at least two vertices or larger, either the induced subgraph is a connected component in C, you would say that it's in G. So you would say that this is either G connected or, sorry, wrong. It's either G disconnected, disconnected, or G bar disconnected. Well, suppose not. Suppose that I did have uh, uh, X, which is connected in both G and G bar. Okay, so my picture might be something like this. In G, the picture looks like this. <coughs> X is connected in G and in G bar. If it's a clique, I'm done. Because if this was a clique, then its complement would be an independent set. That's certainly not connected. So there must be some non-edge in this 
set. Let's call it AB, a non-edge. Well, but this is connected, so there's a path between A and B. Let's take a shortest path. If that shortest path was, say, hop, 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 I'd have a P4. So I can, can't go hop, 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 hop. I can only go hop, hop. So there may, so there is some Y that sees both A and B. Great. Now, what's going on in G bar in the meantime? In G bar, A and B are connected. And they are disjoint from Y. But G bar, X in G bar, is also connected. So there must be some way to get from A to Y. Again, if I were to go from A to Y with a hop, 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 I would find a P4 here. The complement of a P4 is a P4. So I must have a Z that sees both A and Y. So I have this, this, and this. And these is an edge. What's happening between B and Z? Well, if it's a non-edge, I have a P4. So it must be connected. Now this is my state of the art uh, in G complement. Let's go back and see what's happening over uh, in G's neighborhood. Well, we still have A and B. And we still have Y. And now we have Z. And Z is connected to all three of them here. So it's disconnected to all of them here. Well, let's keep playing the game. Hmm. Uh, Z and Y are not connected. So there must be something that connects them. It has to be a common vertex. It can't be hop, hop, hop. So there must be a Y prime that sees both of them. And now, hop, 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 no edge, no edge. So A and Y prime better be connected, otherwise I would have a C, I would have a B4. So this is connected. Similarly, down here, what about B to Y prime? Well, if it was missing, then I would have a different P4. So it is also connected. Now what's going on downstairs? Well, you can guess. I have this, I have this, this. Not dot, 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 this. And now I have a new vertex, y prime, which is dot, dot, dot. This is disconnected. This is disconnected. This is disconnected. This is disconnected. And now I take him and maybe here. There must be a z prime that sees both of those. And so forth. This will be connected. This will be disconnected, and so on. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm growing this iteration after iteration after iteration. Okay, this construction keeps going on forever. But I, I'm running out of vertices. X is finite, so I'll get stuck. It can't happen that you can go on forever with the finite set. So this will eventually stop. Eventually, I won't be able to continue any further. And that will be my contradiction for the assumption that there is such an x. Therefore, there isn't. Now let's look at the last implication, which is very easy. We assume that for every x, either it's disconnected in G, or it's disconnected in G, prime, G bar. And I want to show that that imp implies that I can construct a co-tree. That's a co-graph, and I can construct a co-tree. 
Well, that's really simple. It's exactly what this was designed to do. If the if take all of the vertices, we'll do this by induction too. Take all the vertices. Well, they are form an X. If they, it is disconnected, well, if it's disconnected, I have separate components. Great. Now I can assume that the theorem is true for each component. Therefore, each of these is a co-graph. And therefore, the disjoint union of is a co-graph. I'm done. If it is connected, well, then its complement is disconnected. In the complement, that also partitions the vertices into pieces. The only difference is now, though in the complement, these pieces I have these pieces. So in the graph itself, I have them all joined together. So again, I work on each one separately by recursion. They are co-graphs. The join of co-graphs is co-graphs, and I'm done. So that's the proof of the theorem. Now we can go back to the slides. So I've proved this uh, very nice theorem characterizing co-graphs. How do we recognize a co-graph? Well, I think that we've just sort of seen it, and I'll just go through these steps, which uh, repeat w the construction I just did. But the naive algorithm would simply be to construct the co-tree. If it's the graph is disconnected, create make a label root 0 and continue recursively on each component. If it's connected, make a label rooted 1. Look at the complement. If the complement is connected, then fail. Otherwise, I partition the vertices and I can continue recursively. The complexity of this naive algorithm would be n to the third power, n cubed. But over time, there have been linear time algorithms found by Derek Corneal and various friends of his. In fact, the name co-graph stands for complement reducible graph, since it can be decomposed by using this naive algorithm. The name was actually coined by a student of Derek's called, uh, named uh, Lurks, Helmut, Helmut Lurks, in a tech report that he wrote at the University of Toronto in 1971. Uh, Lorna Stewart worked on the problem in the late 70s. And by, I think it was 81, 82, they published their major paper on co-graphs. So here we have uh, this, uh, just another example. If this is my graph, how do I decompose it? I st it's connected, so I start with the root, labeled 1. I look at its complement, partitions it into two pieces. I create subtrees for those pieces with zeros. Then I, I look at that su subtree. It partitions into these pieces. Here is my co-tree so far. Then I look at this part. It builds this part of the co-tree, and continuing right along, adding CD, I'm growing my co-tree just by decomposing. And this is the ends up being the co-tree or the original graph. And there it is in another view. And notice here that my label zeros turned into stars. No. Uh, My label zeros, yeah, turned into, sorry, my label zeros turned into pluses, and my label ones turned into stars. And there's a reason for that. And that's going to be the connection with the functions, the read ones functions. So recall that a co-graph, a co-occurrence graph, we formed from a Boolean function, where each prime implicant or term gave us uh, a complete subgraph in this graph. And we recall this example, and here was our graph, which happens to be the graph that we just worked on. This is the 
co-occurrence graph for this formula. So this was taking a function and creating a graph for it. Now let's look at how to take a graph and create a function for it. Let's take an arbitrary graph for each maximal clique in the graph, I want to create a prime implicate of a new function called the function of the graph. Here's an example. This graph has a, a triangle here, CEF, that gives me this term. A triangle here, ABC, gives me this term, an edge, AD, an edge, CF, uh, DF gives me this formula. So here I take a graph and I build a function. Now you might say, ah, but you're using maximal cliques. We know that it's hard to find all the maximal cliques of a graph. Ah, that's true. But we're only going to end up doing it for co-graphs. And that's going to be simple. I must introduce one other notion about normality. A, fun a function is normal if this process of taking the function, mapping it to its co-occurrence graph, and then taking the co-occurrence graph and mapping it back to a function yields the original function that you have. If it does, this two-step process gives you the same thing. We call it a normal function. So f is normal if and only if the cliques of the graph are the precisely the prime implicants of the original. Here's an example. If f1 was abc, the function abc, it would give me the triangle as its co-occurrence graph. If my function was ab plus ac plus bc, it would also give me the same triangle as its co-occurrence graph. Going the opposite direction, however, the triangle gives me function number one. So number one, ABC is normal. AB plus AC plus BC is abnormal. Now we come to Gervich's theorem. Let F be a positive function and let gamma be the graph of F, then the following statements are equivalent f1 is a read once function. It has a factored form where every variable appears once. If and only if, it is a normal function, and its graph contains no subgraph isomorphic to p4. Look at that. It's giving me two conditions that characterize together read once function. The gra uh, graph has to be a co-graph. The function has to be normal. Other conditions that are, do, that are uh, equivalent that we won't go into as deeply, the graph, and it, the graph of its dual function are complementary. And another one for all prime implicants of the, uh, of the function and all prime implicants of the dual of that function, the cardinality has to be equal to 1. I just give you those results, but you We'll have to read up on that if you're interested in following up. Both of those conditions are important and required. Here's a function. Who's a fr uh, you can easily see its co-occurrence graph is the cordless 5 cycle. It is normal, but its graph is not a co-graph. C5 has a P4, but this is normal. On the other hand, its dual happens to be this function, and its co-occurrence graph is the complete graph on five vertices. It is not normal, but it is graph is a co-graph. So both of these normality and co-graph conditions are required. So the me proposed method for recognizing read once functions is simply this: you take an input in in sum of products or product of some form, either way, it doesn't matter. In computer science, we would say DNF or CNF. 
we test to make sure it's unary. We build the co-occurrence graph. We run a co-graph recognition algorithm, like an efficient one of Corneal's, or a slow one, like the naive. That gives us a co-tree and the function uh, f of the graph. Of course, if it failed to be co-graph, we quit and go home. If we can succeed, we continue, we check normality. If it's not normal, we quit and go home. Otherwise, we declare it to read once, and the co-tree actually gives you the factored form. What is the complexity of this? Well, you <coughs> use of Gurevich's theorem and co-graph uh, recognition together with checking normality in polynomial time will end up giving us an al uh, algorithm whose complexity is on the order of L, the length of the input formula size, times N, the number of variables in the function. So it is polynomial time algorithm based on the product of how long the input is times the number of variables. Let me just say something about the previous work on this problem. In 1975, you have the first paper on this, and 20 years later, another paper on it. Uh, I don't think that Pear and Pinter knew about Hayes in the first place, but they have different techniques, and both of them give algorithms which are exponential in complexity. There was additional work on them done in, on the, in the theoretical mathematical side, those characterizations. The work by Gurevich was done uh, in the early 80s, but it was only published in English in uh, the 1990s, 1991. Another paper, uh, totally independent, not knowing about Gurevich's work, uh, gave the same theorem in 93. Another work in the theory who that did know about these, um, at least some of it, from com uh, computer learning theory, uses uh, this characterization in trying to uh, try to learn read one's functions. So here was our algorithm. First, we check that it's u positive or unate. We build the co-occurrence co co graph, test if it's a co-tree, then test normality. But how do we do it efficiently? Well, the camel is supposed to indicate uh, an efficient water usage uh, machine. How about a efficient computer machine? So for the co-graph co recognition, uh, we would use either Corn one of Corneal's algorithms or the naive algorithm. Okay, and that we know how to do. It's checking normality that we don't know how to do. Well, I know how to do it. I'm going to tell you how to do it. The way we'll do it is to compare the input representation, it's the sum of products, or product of sum, and the generated function that we get from the co-tree, the parse tree. Okay. On the one hand, we have the expanded form. On the other hand, we have the factored form. We need to decide whether the cliques of the graph of this function equal the prime implicants of the original. So here is how we're going to do it. First, let's, let's look at the original function and the prime implicants of that. Okay, We're going to make a bit matrix, which will simply be the characteristic vectors of each prime implicant. So imagine, for example, I have this bit matrix. It's zeros and ones. I'm going to have my variables, v1, v2, up to vn, 
and I'm going to have prime implicate one, prime implicate two. These are just the terms of your DNF. And I'm just going to have ones when it's in it and zeros when it's not. The, char the usual characteristic ve vector. Okay, and here are my list of prime implicants, and I've just given the characteristic vector for this the, for its set of variables. We'll call that P. What I'd like to do now is, and I have to show you how to do that, build another matrix similarly, V1 up to Vn, where these will be the max cliques, the maximal cliques, cliques of the graph. I guess I was using gamma gamma that I get from uh, from the uh, from my uh, factored form of the co-graph. Okay, so, and here I will also have characteristic vectors for each clique. And then I'll just compare, are they the same? Are the prime implicants the same as the max cliques? This is easy to build. This, you have to sh I shall have to show you how to build them. So what do I have with me? I have my co-tree, and from that, I want to find all of the maximal cliques of the co-tree, of the co-graph. Okay, it's better for me to do it on an example. Okay, here's my example. Uh, here's a co-tree. It represents the factored form at the bottom of the slide. <coughs> what are its maximal cliques? So here is how I'm going to do it. Uh, and I will try to explain what's on the slide, and if I can explain that correctly, you'll understand perfectly what the algorithm is. So let's look at, look at this. I have variables A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. <coughs> I'll say that A is vertex 1, and I'm going to write that in binary. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. B is zero 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 one zero, <coughs> etc. Et down to G, which is one zero 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 zero. This is the characteristic vector of each of these uh, singletons. And sometimes I will call A one, and sometimes I'll call this two and C I'll call 4, and D I'll call 8, and G I'll call 64. Because sometimes I like to look at this in binary, when I'm looking at the characteristic vector, and sometimes I look at it in base 10, which is more familiar to me. This is the numbering of the singletons. Now, <coughs> what happens on my, back to uh, my co-tree on the slides, what happens when I take A and B? 
singleton A, singleton B, and take their disjoint union. Well, they are individual vertices. The disjoint union is two cliques, one, a one-point clique and another one-point clique. And so I record that as the list, the clique consisting of one, which is A, and the clique consisting of two, which is B. On the other hand, if I take over here on the right, let's say, the join of a single vertex E, a single vertex F, I get an edge EF, that is a single clique, and I'm listed here as the single clique 48. Why 48? Because this was 16, this was 32, this is meaning bit number 5 was lit, Oops. Bit number six was lit. Here, bit number five and six are lit. So the so forty-eight is simply the binary string consisting of the set E F. That's a click. Same over here. <coughs> I take the disjoint union. Sorry, I took the join and I get the clique consisting of C D, the edge C D which is denoted in the characteristic vector as 12, meaning bit number 3 and bit number 4. More interesting is here. What happens if I take this clique, this clique, and this clique, and take their disjoint union? Well, I have three separate cliques. So I have a list of them. I have clique consisting of CD, encoded as 12, G alone, encoded as 64, and B and e D, e F cons as 48. And now finally, if you have with me so far, here I have the disjoint union of three cliques. Here I have the disjoint union of two cliques. If I want to take the join of those, okay, so what am I doing? I'm taking these two cliques, uh, this clique as one side, this was A and B. I'm taking this clique and this clique and this clique, which are C, D, G, and E, F on the other side. Now I'm taking their join. What are the cliques of the join? Well, cliques of the join will be one from the right and one from the left. So this and this will be a clique, A and G, A and the other two. So here I have a clique, here I have a clique, here I have a clique, and same here. I have six cliques. And what are those six cliques? It's the cross product of these two. So we have 1 and 12, which is 13. 1 and 64, which is 65. 1 and 48 is 49. 2 and, notice I'm doing these in bit operations. So what looks like addition is really just uh, union of the bit vectors. And similarly, 2 crossed with these give me these. So now I have six cliques here, and here they are. What did I have in my original formula here? Well, I could calculate them the same way. And lo and behold, I have the same six cliques. The uh, cliques of the co-graph in this example are the same as the prime implicants of my original. OK. Uh, let's, where am I? OK. So. What do I have? I have the bit vector for the prime influence. I have the bit vector or the bit matrix for the co-graph uh, max cliques. I sort them lexicographically. I now compare them. Either the same or, or they're different. Of course, I could cut the situation if I if the size of the matrices was different. I wouldn't even have to compare. But if they're the same size, I do have to compare. Okay. So that is the way that we were able to uh, check normality. And the bottom line complexity 
is dominated by normality, which is the length of the input times n. We did a, some experimental results on some uh, on R method versus some standard library packages on factoring Boolean fu functions and how they performed. And uh, you can see these are f some of these are very big functions. The ones that are in the libraries uh, generally ran more time than ours. Both gave correct solutions. OK, so my conclusion is that uh, here we have both an interesting theory of uh, co-graphs and how it was used in this real computer science electrical engineering uh, application. <coughs> so now I'd just like to conclude with one more remark. And that is, you recall from the last lecture, I said that co-graphs co which you now know what they are, would be a subfamily of permutation, which we learned last week, and which itself had the property that they are TRO and the complements are TRO. How do we know that co-graphs are permutation graphs? Well, I didn't talk at all about transitive orientations. But let's just see the immediate observation of why co-graphs are permutation graphs. And I'll show that very simply. Co-graphs have this nice form of a co-tree in decomposition. So a co-graph, remember, I'll do this by induction, looks either as disjoint co-graphs. If that's the case, I take a TRO here, TRO in each piece, combine them, I have a TRO of the whole graph. So a co-graph is TRO in this case. If, on the other hand, my co-graph was connected, it would be of this form, the join of co-graphs. Well, that's also very simple. Take a transitive orientation of each piece, and now just make all edges go just like you would orient a clique. And that gives you an orientation of the whole graph. So what I've showed is that a co-graph, either case, is TRO. But, if a <coughs> but the complement of a co-graph, being P4 free, is, all, is a, exactly a co-graph. They are self-complementary. And so if the co-graph is, is TRO and the complement is TRO, so it, it's co-TRO, so this graph is both TRO and co-TRO, and so it falls within permutation graphs. That's a kind of fast proof of that. OK, so next time I'll show you how this read once algorithm fits into the larger computer science question of factoring Boolean functions. And we'll also talk a little bit more graph theory. So that's it for my por portion of today's lecture. And I'll see you tomorrow. But stay tuned. We have a student who's going to give a, a presentation coming right up. <coughs>